Hello and welcome to another episode of Reading Together from Seaharp Press. I'm Eugene Lunning, co-founder of Seaharp, and today we'll be diving back into C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters. This is a HarperCollins hardcover edition of the book. It's not part of the Seaharp catalog, but if you're interested in Lewis like we are, check out some of our C.S. Lewis content right here on the YouTube channel, or check out his foreword to Athanasius's On the Incarnation, which is part of our Timeless series. In our last episode, we were on letter number 17, so today, letter 18. My dear Wormwood, even under slubgob, you must have learned at college the routine technique of sexual temptation. And since, for us spirits, this whole subject is one of considerable tedium, though necessary as part of our training, I will pass it over. But on the larger issues involved, I think you have a good deal to learn. The enemy, God's, demand on humans takes the form of a dilemma. Either complete abstinence or unmitigated monogamy. Ever since our father's first great victory, and again to remind you, the father here is Satan. Ever since our father's first great victory, we have rendered the former very difficult to them. The latter, for the last few centuries, we have been closing up as a way of escape. We have done this through the poets and novelists by persuading the humans that a curious and usually short-lived experience, which they call being in love, is the only respectable ground for marriage. That marriage can and ought to render this excitement permanent, and that a marriage which does not do so is no longer binding. This idea is our parody of an idea that came from the enemy. It's interesting as we dive into a chapter that obviously is going to delve into human interrelationship, sexuality. It's interesting to read this and think about what life was like when this book was written 80-ish years ago versus now. Think about all the ways that married life has frankly crumbled systemically across our entire culture. I'll be interested to see where he goes, but it's a fascinating thing to think that he could speak almost satirically about it back then when we know where we are now. I'll keep reading. The whole philosophy of hell rests on recognition of the axiom that one thing is not another thing, and especially that one self is not another self. My good is my good, and your good is yours. What one gains, another loses. Even an inanimate object is what it is by excluding all other objects from the space it occupies. If it expands, it does so by thrusting other objects aside or by absorbing them. A self does the same. With beasts, the absorption takes the form of eating. For us, it means the sucking of will and freedom out of a weaker self into a stronger. To be means to be in competition. If we were thinking of this in terms of sort of like a, a logical perspective or even a rhetorical perspective, we would call what he's describing a zero-sum game. If I succeed, it means you have lost. If I take this much, then that means that's something you have lost. It's where everyone is counteropposed to everyone. That's what Lewis is describing via screw tape. Now, the enemy, God's philosophy, is nothing more nor less than one continued attempt to evade this very obvious truth. He aims at a contradiction. Things are to be many, yet somehow also one. The good of one self is to be the good of another. This impossibility he calls love. And this same monotonous panacea can be detected under all he does and even all he is or claims to be. Thus he is not content, even himself, to be a sheer arithmetic, ar arithmetical, oh gosh, I can't get that word. I knew I was going to stumble on the word arithmetical, you get it, unity. He claims to be three as well as one in order that this nonsense about love may find a foothold in his own nature. At the other end of the scale, he introduces into matter that obscene invention, the organism. 
in which the parts are perverted from their natural destiny of competition and made to cooperate. Now, what's interesting here, I just described to you the zero-sum game that he was describing in the paragraph before. What is he, Lewis, again through the lips of screw tape, what is he putting against the zero-sum game as the very nature of God? Love. Love that you and I know, if we stop to think about it, is not a feeling. It's a choice and an action. It's an activity that is not really passive. It, it, it's, it's active. It is to love to actually put the other before yourself, to see their triumphs not as some judgment against you or your own failure, but to realize that in the way of God, in the way we get to see Jesus live the human life, thus is love. So let's continue, but keep that forefront. He's talking about love. We'll keep going. His, meaning God's, real motive for fixing on sex as the method of reproduction among humans, is only too apparent from the use he has made of it. Sex might have been, from our point of view, quite innocent. It might have been merely one more mode in which a stronger self preyed upon a weaker, as it is indeed among the spiders, where the bride concludes her nuptials by eating the groom. But in the humans, the enemy has gratuitously associated affection between the parties with sexual desire. He has also made the offspring dependent on the parents and given the parents an impulse to support it, thus producing the family, which is like the organism, only worse, for the members are more distinct, yet also united in a more conscious and responsible way. The whole thing, in fact, turns out to be simply one more device for dragging in love. Now, I don't want to get too personal here because this is a little bit of a hot-button subject, but I am fascinated with the way that C.S. Lewis, who for so much of his life was a confirmed bachelor, I think he's so right on with the idea that the sexual desire is so allied with affection. I would even go so far as to say friendship. For those of you who are married, don't you find that there is a more wonderful rhythm to your sexual life when there's friendship afoot? Like when you and your spouse are truly looking out for each other in that day-by-day -day playful friendship way. For those of you who are maybe dreaming of finding that person and getting married, I would just remind you that what you're looking for is a deep, deep friendship. Not a friendship that's like all the other ones, purely platonic, a friendship where, yes, there's desire, but at the end of the day, all you really want to do is spend life with this person, enjoy that affection, that kindness, and you just feel like you could have a conversation that never ends. That's what you're looking for. It's like a taste of home. Just to remind you, let's keep reading. Now comes the joke. The enemy, God, described a married couple as one flesh. He did not say a happily married couple or a couple who married because they were in love, but you can make the humans ignore that. You can also make them forget that the man they call Paul did not confine it to married couples. Mere copulation for him makes one flesh. You can thus get the humans to accept as rhetorical eulogies of being in love what were in fact plain descriptions of the real significance of sexual intercourse. The truth is that wherever a man lies with a woman, there, whether they like it or not, a transcendental relation is set up between them, which must be eternally enjoyed or eternally endured. From the true statement that this transcendental relation was intended to produce and, if obediently entered into, too often will produce affection and the family, humans can be made to infer the false belief that the blend of affection, fear, and desire, which they call being in love, is the only thing that makes marriage either happy or holy. The error is easy to produce because being in love does very often, in Western Europe, precede marriages which are made in obedience to the enemy's designs. That is, with the intention of fidelity, fertility, and goodwill. Just as religious emotion very often, but not always, attends 
conversion. In other words, the humans are to be encouraged to regard as the basis for marriage a highly colored and distorted version of something the enemy really promises as its result. Two advantages follow. In the first place, humans who have not the gift of continence can be deterred from seeking marriage as a solution because they do not find themselves in love. And thanks to us, the idea of marrying with any other motive seems to them low and cynical. Yes, they think that. They regard the intention of loyalty to a partnership for mutual help, for the preservation of chastity, and for the transmission of life as something lower than a storm of emotion. Don't neglect to make your man think the marriage service very offensive. In the second place, any sexual infatuation whatever, so long as it intends marriage, will be regarded as love, and love will be held to excuse a man from all the guilt, and to protect him from all the consequences of marrying a heathen, a fool, or a wanton. But more of this in my next. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. So as we come to the end of that letter, and clearly it has a cliffhanger ending where he's going to continue along this line, I want to remind you where we started. We started with the idea of the zero-sum game, of the fact that in this world, and according to like our fleshy selves, your gain is my loss. But in the kingdom of heaven, we have been given an economy that is literally endless, so that we can have eyes that look with joy upon other people's triumphs, big moments, their little wins. We don't have to feel diminished because we love them. Even the person that we don't know particularly well, we have the ability in Jesus to reach out with love, the love of God. And I'll say again, for those of you who are looking and dreaming of someday being in a committed married relationship, it's a beautiful thing. It's an absolute joy to meet someone who the Lord would knit your hearts together, would give you that eternal bond of deep, deep friendship, where the day by day of life becomes the joy of life. All the little things are actually preparatory to the beauty of what is called sex. For those of you who are married, committed, have been at it for a while with this person, I would remind you that the place you have been placed with this spouse is a high and holy place for you to showcase the love of Jesus for each other and to give witness to the world that this is how good Jesus is right here in our marriage. Take a look. And before we dive into the next chapter in our next episode, I just want to remind you that sex is not dirty. It is not something that we should be ashamed of or that we should say, oh, we don't talk about that in these circles. Friends, the capital P pleasures of life that were given to us by our Heavenly Father are beautiful things in the contexts in which he's made them to be. So it's not something we need to be embarrassed about. It's something we should talk about more freely in the church. And so I want to remind you, he made it. He anticipated our needs for each other. And he blesses them in the bonds of marriage, husband and wife. It's just a beautiful thing that he's prepared and given to us. So thanks again, as always, for joining me on Reading Together. We've been in the Screwtape Letters, and that was letter number 18. I look forward to our next episode, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.